Now I alluded to this topic earlier, but I'll go ahead and give you some formal introduction to it here in that databases are generally not accessed by the users but are found on database servers so that they can be accessed by multiple users at one time as they're doing work. You don't want just one person being able to do work, so there's generally multiple people that need to do work to a, a database. So uh, having it on the database server allows for this functionality of having multiple users be able to work on that database and to provide a higher level of performance than just on a standalone machine. Now, the one I talked about earlier that we will primarily be focused on is the Microsoft SQL Server. Now when we get into working with this more you'll see that or we'll find out that periodically SQL Server will analyze queries and create indexes which we'll talk about later to optimize their performance. And you can't, this isn't as easily done or as quickly done on a standalone machine as on a database server as you'll find out as you continue to work with them. Um, and you can find evidence of this by looking at those indexes that I talked about before. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about this as we move on and as you read. But uh, just wanted to kind of introduce that topic too. One of the topics I want to talk about with databases and, and database servers is constraints. Now these are rules or limitations that are placed on fields or columns and you've done this before if you've worked with Microsoft Access but these constraints ensure that data is considered um, good data so if it doesn't meet the limitations if it's bad data it's invalid it's not going to allow it and there's several constraints that SQL Server works with such as a unique constraint which allows the database admin to specifically identify which column should not contain duplicate values it should be unique you have check constraints that allow the admin to limit the types of data that a user can insert into that database uh, default constraints the not null constraint is used a lot where this will ensure that data is entered into a cell so you can't just have a cell be blank and you know you can do this in uh, other databases such as access but then if you enforce a not null constraint then the field cannot be left empty. Uh, you have the primary key constraint which you've worked with before as well and with the primary key constraint this uh, uniquely identifies each record in a database table that way there can't be any duplicates. Uh, the primary key must contain unique values and once again when we talk about null it cannot contain any type of null values and now when you're working with databases every table should have a primary key and each table can have only one primary key if you remember from working with Microsoft Access you also have what's called a foreign key so, and you can have a foreign key constraint with SQL Server as well in which uh, one table points to a primary key in another table that's how we define a foreign key now when you install a Microsoft SQL Server package, you also install the SQL Server Management Studio, or the SSMS. Uh, you'll hear me jump back and forth with this term all the time. And the, the SSMS is pri the primary tool for managing the server and the server's databases using a graphical user interface so that it's easy for the user to do those functions that need to be done. So you can browse, select, and manage any of the objects within the server using the SQL Server Management Studio. Now you can also use the SQL Server Management Studio to view and optimize database performance as well as to create and modify databases, tables, and indexes. One of the best features that you'll get to work with, uh, that you'll hopefully get to work with, is, with the SQL Server Management Studio is the Query Analyzer and this provides a GUI based interface to write and execute various queries so uh, there's various um, programming languages that the query analyzer will support and I, I won't go into detail on those but I'll just mention a couple you have xquery which is a query and functional programming language that's designed to query collections of XML data uh, you'll you have SQL CMD, which is a command line application that comes with Microsoft SQL Server. And it kind of exposes some of the management features of the SQL Server. And it allows SQL queries to be written and executed from a command prompt. 
So I just want to kind of introduce those to you a little bit. And just so you can see, here's a uh, screenshot of the SQL Server Management Studio. And you can see it probably looks pretty familiar what you're used to with the menus and, and kind of the layout. And as you work with this, you'll see where your tables and everything is located here on the left side and the Object Explorer area. And there's, depending on what you're working with, this area over here will be different. And as you continue to read and look at these, you will see the differences. As I mentioned just a minute ago, here is the Query Analyzer in which you can write your SQL queries and then run them and you can see the results down below and you can see here results uh, so as you're running your query you will see the results so as you build your queries you'll reuse your queries um, it's just I can't emphasize that enough to make sure that you save queries and don't just run them once and get rid of them because you can always expand on that later on and it's you'll be surprised as to how much time it'll save yourself if you save your queries now I want to talk a little bit about DML or data manipula manipulation language which is a language element which allows you to use different statements and some of the statements are listed here you can see those listed here we have the select statement, the insert statement, update, delete, and merge and these are used to manipulate data in your SQL server tables. Um, a select statement retrieves rows from the database and enables the selection of one or more rows or columns from one or very many tables in an SQL server. And if you look here you can see that we did in fact here use the select element here when we wanted to select this information from here and when we ran our script here we have our data here it shows all the information that we defined up here only down here. And you'll get we'll get more into SQL statements later on. But I just wanted you to see that you use this, these DML uh, language elements and it's not just theory or whatever, you will actually use those. The next one we have is the insert and this just adds one or even more rows to a table or if you're using a view, creating a view, you can insert with your view. The update changes data that's already there. The delete removes rows from a table or view. And I'll talk a little bit about some commands here that are going to seem similar, but they're not. And then we have merge, which just performs an insert or update on a target table based on the results of a join. And we'll work with joins later on. Now, generally speaking, when you use these DML statements like the insert, update, or delete, realize this, they either succeed or they don't. So if you're trying to insert some records into a table but maybe you violated a constraint, then it's not going to work. So you know, just think about, think about that. So um, when using these DML statements here, make sure you query the table to verify that the key constraints are met and that you have the correct syntax. As with any programming language, syntax is key. Now we'll move from data manipulation language to data definition language or DDL. And this is just a subset of the transaction SQL language. It pretty much deals with creating database objects like tables, creating constraints, and creating stored procedures. Um, some of the commands that we use with DDL are use, create, alter, and drop as well as truncate and delete. And you can see that use just changes the some of the database context for create um, allows you to create an actual database object such as a view or stored procedure or a table. Uh, if you use the alter command it can be used to change an object that already exists. And then you know drop removes an object from the database. Now with the alter command like I said, that can be used to add new fields or change any data that's already existing. And an example of this would be like if you were going to alter a table, you could use the command alter table and then you could like give it, um, you want to add some type of file to it. That is where you're actually changing that format of an existing field. So that is where you would use 
the alter command. The truncate, this removes rows from a table and frees up space used by those rows. Remember that, it removes rows from a table and frees up space. Now delete removes rows from a table but does not free up the space used by those rows removed. So there's a big difference there between when you use the truncate and the delete. Just remember that if you use the truncate, it will free up space in the database. Lastly, we'll talk about system tables. Now when you want to query system views to verify whether the object you want to drop are in fact in the database tables, you need to know what the tables are and that are most useful. And these system views belong to the sys schema. Now a schema is a description of a database to a database management system in the language provided by that database management system. And I'll say that one more time. A schema is a description of the database to a DBMS in the language provided by that DBMS. And here are some of those important sys tables to look at. You have uh, sys.tables, or sorry, the system views. Um, some of these include uh, like the sys.columns, sys.databases, sys.views, and we'll look at these later on as we continue through the course. Now I know we went over a lot of information with database, the types of databases, uh, talking a little bit about SQL Server, the three types of files used with SQL Server, SQL Server Management Studio, data manipulation language, data definition language. I know there's a lot of data here. Um, I just hope the uh, tutorial here helped you with your reading and getting prepared for moving on to lesson two. So thank you for joining along here in lesson one. And I look forward to seeing you in lesson two.